and welcome to another edition of History Hullabaloo here at Pueblo West Library with Miss Beth. Today we are going to talk about something that isn't specific to a um, certain time period in history. It's actually over many, many centuries. And you know as well as I do that I love food. So we are going to talk all about war rations today. So what are war rations? Well, they were specific um, amounts and types of food that were fed to soldiers um, throughout the centuries during different wars to ensure that they were well fed and they got the proper nutrition so that they could keep on going um, and to also ensure that it was um, fair access to food for everyone that was involved in the war. So um, some of the foods that I'm going to show you today um, look similar throughout the centuries. You can see that but there's a few changes as we'll go along and um, I want you to see if you can pick out the changes as we go along, what new additions were added, what um, different things they added onto each ration. Uh, and so when you think about wars, you think about all the different soldiers that are involved and how much of a problem it probably was to be able to feed all these guys. And especially when they're moving around to different locations and sometimes moving quite fast. How do you keep up with that and how do you feed them all? Well, um, so things like dried and salted foods and grains and um, like really hard crackers and stuff, things that lasted a really long time, um, canned foods, a lot of those um, were what rations were made out of because they didn't require refrigeration. Um, they could be hauled over long, hard, dusty roads and um, not be affected by it. So. Let's see, the first one I have here are the rations from the Roman army, which you may have heard of. It was about 2,000 years ago, and they were spread out over Europe and a little bit of Asia um, and focused in Italy. And they were, so they were spread out over this massive area, and it required a massive amount of people to feed. So they didn't have any prepackaged foods back then. So they had to rely on a lot of uh, dried foods and things that would last a long time. Um, and that stretched a far away. So my examples here are a lot of dried grains. They ate a lot of barley and wheat. Um, and they harvested, or not harvested, but um, took a lot of sheep from the local farms that they are traveling through to feed themselves. So they got their meats and their grains. And they also carried with them a lot of olive oil which was their main source of um, fats as they went along. And so as they were traveling through the countryside to different areas, they would take from the farms, take from the farmers that were surrounding them. And regardless of what the farmers thought, whether they liked it or not, um, they took their food and they used that to feed themselves. So a little bit later in history where the crusade which took place between the 11th and 15th centuries in um, Europe and Asia. And they were fed with similar foods to the Roman army, meats and grains, most likely. And, um, but the big difference is a lot of um, crusaders were from different parts of Europe and from various countries, and they, they, were, they weren't really centralized. So they were responsible for feeding themselves so bringing a lot of food from home with them, which once again means that they had a lot, have a lot of different foods that lasted a long time. So that would be your dried meats, like your jerkies and your salted meats, um, a lot of dried grains, once again, barley, wheat, um, which they ground into flour, which is what we have here. And they would bake their bread as they went along over fires. Um, and they would also harvest from local farms that they traveled through. Um, so they had to feed themselves uh, for a very long time. A lot of times they were gone for years. So food was very scarce at points and they had to take what they could get. And the next one is skipping all the way to the American Revolution, which is probably something you may have learned about in school. It was in the 1700s, a little over 200 years ago. Um, here in the United States when the 13 colonies that originally formed the United States fought against Britain. And so this is when the foods really started to change the rations. Um, so as you can see here, there's quite a bit of more variety. So what each American um, 
soldier in the revolution got. It was very uh, weighed out and very specific in specific amounts. So we had one pound of beef or fish, which is right here. This is what each soldier got. One pound of flour or bread. If they just got the flour, they would be responsible for making it into their own bread. So three pounds of peas and beans. One pint of milk. One pint of rice, which we have here. One quart of cider. A little molasses which was like um, a sweetener. And they would also um, take from the surrounding farms that they traveled through um, to feed themselves. So that's where they would get their fresh meats and their fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables and everything like that. So you can see a little more variety here. Um, and everything is kind of weighed out in specific portions, like we said. And I do have a little excerpt from a book here that I'd like to read you. And now this is from um, Washington at Valley, Valley Forge by Russell Friedman. And this explains um, a wintertime encampment that George Washington spent at Valley Forge in Pennsylvania. And so as you can imagine, um, without grocery stores and things that they could go to on a daily basis, wintertime could be kind of hard when it came to food and supplying themselves with the proper amount of food. So um, what I'm going to read you is a little bit of what they felt during that time. So our prospect was indeed dreary, Private Joseph Plum Martin recalled. In our miserable condition to go into the wild woods and build us habitations to stay in, in such a weak, starved, and naked condition was appalling in the highest degree especially to New Englanders, unaccustomed to such kinds of hardships at home. However, there was no remedy, no alternative, but this or dispersion. But dispersion, I believe, was not thought of, at least I did not think of it. We had engaged in the defense of our injured country, and we were determined to persevere as long as such hardships were not altogether intolerable. During the Army's first two days of Valley Forge, Food rations were so scarce. All Martin could find to eat was half of a small pumpkin, which I cooked by placing it upon a rock, the skin side uppermost, and making a fire upon it. By the time it was heated through, I devoured it with as keen an appetite as I should a pie and eat of it at some other time. Martin's plain singed pumpkin was at least a break from the men's usual fare. They often had fire cake, which were tasteless patties made of flour and water baked on hot stones for breakfast, for dinner, and for supper, sometimes along with pepper hot soup, which was a thin tripe broth flavored by a handful of peppercorns. One day, just before Christmas, food rations ran out completely, and chants of no meat, no meat spread throughout the camp. Some of the men began to imitate screeching owls and calling crows, suggesting that they might fly their coops like birds of prey and march into the countryside to find food at the point of their bayonets. Officers raced back and forth among the tents, their swords drawn, shouting for the men to quiet down. Brigadier General James Varnum of Rhode Island warned Washington, the men must be supplied or they cannot be commanded. So. As you can see, that gives you a little taste of how um, during the winter time, a lot of the armies went through a lot of hardships trying to feed themselves. And when they did come across food like Martin and this small half pumpkin, they had kind of a hard time trying to cook it because all they had were um, weak little snow covered fires. So that was the American Revolution. Next up, we have the Civil War, which is kind of an interesting. I have a lot of interesting stuff here. So for this, it was kind of similar to the American Revolution and what they were fed. Um, so the Civil War, as you know, was fought between the North or the Union troops and the South or the Confederate troops back in the 19th century. And once again, grains and meats were uh, a large part of their diet. And early in the Civil War, the soldiers were sometimes provided with uncooked meat and 
cornmeal or flour, and they were responsible for cooking their own meals based on these few ingredients that they got. So this led to a lot of um, nights spent around a communal campfire, cooking a large uh, meal for everyone and trying to make it the best they could with what they had at hand. Um, and they ate off of tin plates and drank from tin cups. And I also want to show you this interesting contraption here, which was a knife spoon fork combo, which kind of all folded into one little bar down here. And it took up very little space in their packs and was very light. So that's why they um, carry those around. And I also have a picture here from the Civil War of a few of the soldiers eating from a table. And you can kind of see what they would eat from and the different foods that they would eat. So eventually the fireside meals that I um, just told you about changed into individual meager rations that included um, dehydrated fruits and vegetables, which they called desecrated vegetables. So desecrated is a word that means something that's ruined or disrespected in some way. So they thought that these vegetables were just so disgusting when they were dried out um, that they called them desecrated, but they still ate them because that's all they had. Um, and they had also had hardtack, which is a biscuit made out of flour and water and that is cooked for kind of a long time, so it's really dried out and that means it can last a very long time, sometimes even years without going bad. And I also received a few care packages from home, which kept them going. So here is my plate of Civil War rations. We have the bread, which they would have made out of their flour. We have the cornmeal also. And here are some dehydrated vegetables, which don't look very appetizing, do they? So they would have to soak these in water before they were um, even able to chew them up. And we have some dried salted meat here. And I also have an apple and an onion because uh, Civil War soldiers, like the ones we had mentioned from the American Revolution and the Crusades and the Roman army and everyone before, also gathered from the lands and the farms that they traveled through as they went along, um, regardless of what the farmers had to say. So, but this is how they kept themselves fed off of the um, fresh fruits and vegetables that they gathered. Our next example of rations that we have is from World War I. Now this is very interesting because it's kind of when um, prepackaged foods started to, be, to evolve and come into play. So World War I is a war that took place um, in the early 1900s and was the first truly global war with um, countries all over the world participating. And so food was more varied than it was in earlier wars. Um, there was some standardization, and it, but it often wasn't any more tasty. So the main difference now is that a lot of food was prepackaged and canned, like I said. And this was sometimes supplemented by care packages sent from home. Um, because the mail system was, of course, more of evolved at this point than it was in previous years. So um, families of soldiers back home would, send, would package things up like candy and notes and cakes and mail them to the soldiers at the front. So soldier rations included things like, I'll show you. We got some cheese, um, some crackers or hardtack. Uh, we got some sugar, some jelly, um, and let me show you this picture here of the typical rations from World War I. We got a lot of canned goods, and you can see the um, soup cubes and the bread. And so also they would receive um, a lot of care packages like I said, and this is a picture of Christmas plum pudding, which is something that they looked forward to every year at Christmas. Um, and this was sent from home. And in addition to all this, the soldiers sometimes received what they called an iron ration, which was an emergency um, food pack that they weren't supposed to eat unless it was an absolute dire emergency. And this included things like hardtack, corned beef, tea, and stock cubes. And um, this is what they would eat in case they got separated from um, the main troops. And so there was also another famous, famous 
well, infamous, I should say, or not exactly well liked, but it was something that was very um, prevalent, was Mackinacky, <laughs> which is a funny name for a beef stew that was um, really, really uh, popular throughout World War I, served to the troops. It was this canned stew with carrots and onions and potatoes and beef and um, had like this gravy on it. And the troops said that it was kind of edible if you heated it up, but if you didn't have access to heat and you ate it cold, it was really, really disgusting. And I have a few soldiers' experiences in this book here explaining what they thought of the food at the front. And this comes from um, The First World War and 100 Objects by John Hughes Wilson. So it says, in the trenches, food was often tinned or canned. Corn beef or bully beef, Mackinacki rations, and pork and beans. It's in September 1917, Ernie Rhodes was in a shell hole near Ypres when another soldier dropped in beside him. As Rhodes remembered, his visitor said, ooh, I'm hungry, to which he replied, well, listen, I've got a tin of pork and beans in my haversack. You can have it. We had a little tawny cooker, which was a little tin with fat in it. You could light it and, you could light it and heat things up. So in this shell hole, we got this going, and when I smelt these beans warming up, I told him I didn't like beans. But I said, well, I'll have some of that. And that was the finest meal I've ever had in my entire life. I was really hungry and it was absolutely wonderful. I'll never forget it. And then another soldier, Private Frank Bass from the 9th Battalion in the North Folk Regiment, says this. This is a red letter day. My parcel came this morning with a tin of peaches, loaf and butter, fish paste, tobacco, Sleeping helmet, chocolate, a pair of socks, and a towel. Had peaches for sweet at dinner and fish paste for tea. It was absolutely grand. And then there's a picture of the Mackinacky once again in the can there. And then also pork and beans. And so another interesting thing about World War I and their food that they cooked was, um, so they lived in what they called trenches, which were little um, tunnels and holes dug in the ground to hide themselves. And because of this, they couldn't have very many cook fires. So they often had to heat their food using candles, which means that they didn't have a lot of hot meals and the ones that they did um, warm up didn't get super hot. So most of the food that they ate was kind of lukewarm at best, which made it um, not that tasty. And one more picture I have here of World War I soldiers eating their rations in the trenches. Our next war that we're going to talk about is World War II. And you'll see with this one, there's um, even more variety of food that they got and some really good treats, actually. Um, so it seems that greater attention was paid to things like uh, candy and chocolate and gum, just things that would kind of boost the morale and make them a little bit happier in the war, or while they were fighting at least. So there were um, two different kinds of rations in World War II. One was called the C ration, which was for the combat troops, the troops that were actually fighting, and then K rations, which were for other kinds of troops, the ones that were behind the lines or messengers or cooks or medics or things like that. Um, so the sea rations included things like franks and beans, canned fruit, chewing gum, chocolate, instant coffee, and some toilet paper, and maybe some cheese and biscuits. And the K rations um, were actually three meals in one, with breakfast, lunch, and dinner all in one pack. So it had about four ounces of meat and eggs, cheese, biscuits, candy, gum, salt tablets, and a sugary drink and maybe a wooden spoon and also some toilet paper. And one of the most famous things to come out of World War II, which turned out to be a really um, popular war ration, was Spam. Maybe you've heard of it. So this is a processed canned meat that was actually invented and introduced in 1937, but became very, very popular during World War II because as you can see, it's very conveniently packed in a can 
that can be sent to the troops. And it lasts a long time. It's very small, very light, and um, has protein and stuff in it. So that is where Spam came from. And here's my World War II ration plate. We have some bread, some crackers, um, some cheese. We have some instant coffee here and also the treats like the chocolate and the gum. And of course, we mentioned they are packing toilet paper in these rations at this point too. And here's a picture of soldiers unpacking boxes of, boxes of gum, chocolate, tooth powder, and other rations. So that's kind of what they looked like when they first came in the boxes. And our last example of rations that we're going to talk about is for Vietnam. And Vietnam was um, actually the thing called MREs were first invented or first introduced. And that means MRE stands for a meal ready to eat. And that's pretty much just what they sounded like. So there were several courses all in one package, kind of like the K rations from World War II. Um, so they were often kind of bulky and kind of heavy though, the way they um, came packaged up. So when the soldiers received them, they would often unpack them and repack them in um, extra pairs of socks so that they could like sling them over their back and um, kind of disperse the weight and make it a little easier to carry. Um, so these MREs had things like uh, canned ham and canned bread or um, crackers and cookies and cheese and some sort of dessert like applesauce or sliced peaches or pound cake. And so I have a picture here of um, an MRE from that time period. You'll see chocolate and peanut butter. Um, we've got beef ground with spiced sauce. So it's all wrapped up in these packages here. And once again, during Vietnam, they didn't have ready access to campfires and stoves and everything. So um, there's many instances where soldiers reported they had to heat up their food with um, explosives that they used. So they would poke little holes in the cans and then um, light it up with an explosive and that would heat it up and that would make it edible to eat. So that is how rations evolved throughout the years. We started with the Roman army and their simple grains and olive oils. And then we ended up all the way at Vietnam and World War II with the chocolate and the cheese and the gum and the instant coffee and the toilet paper and the spam. Can't forget the spam. So it's really interesting how things um, evolved over the years throughout these wars and the different um, rations that they were served with the addition of the care packages sent from home once they were able to deliver them through the mail system. So those are all that I have for today for the rations. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this program, and we'll see you next time. Bye.